We had the best time doing the initial breakdown of the body language and behavior in this video, and we decided we'd revisit some of our favorite moments from it. Yeah, I guess sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired, they fell asleep in the car, so I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before. We like to take back roads and just went down that road. And there was a guy standing in the road, flagging me down, so I stopped. So let's talk about some of the words that she uses here. Just going through her story, it's I guess, I guess, and, just, so, but, just, and, and so. She's using interjections to explain the actions, which means she's explaining the behavior and the purpose of her behavior. Truthful people almost never do that. It's interesting that she, when she's telling the created story, she says flagging me down, and she uses herself instead of the word we. It's a guy standing in the road flagging me down. When she's talking about we like to go on these back roads, she switches back because that's probably a truthful statement. We like to take back roads. Throughout the whole thing, there's no emotion on her face whatsoever. And there's a giant flag here. When somebody's discussing something emotional and they want you to feel it too, if the face is not participating in that story, that should be a huge red flag. So. I want you to just close your eyes when this video plays again, and I think you'll agree that it sounds like a really bad narrator trying to audition to read an audiobook. That's what I heard this morning. I like to listen to them first and then watch them on mute and then kind of bring them together. This is one of my favorite subjects, psychopaths. So what I'm going to do today, instead of, of going through and, and knocking out the specific body language in every move, I'm going to tell you about... Everybody remember Jeff Foxworthy, the guys, you might be a redneck if that thing. I'm going to sort of go down a list. So if you have some of these, you may be a psychopath if. So, for example, she's showing what's called shallow affect with her emotions. It's it, they're, they're reduced emotional responses where she should, what she's talking about should have a lot of emotion come with it. A lot of everything from fear to terror to sadness. All these things should be happening, but we don't see any of that. At all. Everything was done in a matter of five or ten seconds. He swung himself around and fired twice. It sounds like she's talking like a, a robot. She sounds like she got a moon accent. I am from the moon. I did this. I did. She just. It just sounds odd. She doesn't show any emotions whatsoever. And the, one, the the hint of emotions that we see are faked, or as she says later on, feigned, when she's talking about something else. So far, we've got shallow effect. And then we have callous and, and uh, a lack of empathy, in other words. So she has no feelings. Not You can feel sympathy for someone say, oh, I feel bad about that. But you can't, as a psychopath, can't put yourself in that person's place and say, oh, that hurts the finger because of this. I know how that feels. They can't do that and say, that's horrible because it feels this way. Way. They can just say, um, that, well, they can't do that. It does. Their brain doesn't work that way. I've got a long list. Then we have lack of remorse or guilt. Don't see that either. Then she doesn't show any remorse for doing that. Shows no guilt for doing that. Feeling horrible about it. And she has what's called a grandiose uh, sense of self, um, which is uh, everything is great. She's the she's the best person in the world. She's brilliant. She's pretty. She's good at everything she does. And we're going to see that thread run throughout all these videos as we go through here. Now, out of the 20 items that are on the um, hair, what's called the hair psychopathy checklist, and Robert Hare's, uh, Dr. Robert Hare's, the guy who came up with this checklist. So if you go down the checklist, oh yeah, and he wrote this book without conscience. And um, so if you go down this checklist, you can you ask. There's a way to do it where you're talking with someone who you suspect of being a psychopath and you ask them questions that deal with these uh, specific items on this list. And you have to ask them a certain way to get them to um, to answer truthfully. You can't say one of them, one of them is being glib. And Greg and I always joke about asking somebody that because they always go, are you glib? You can't you can't say it like that. You have to ask questions so you can see how they answer them. And we're going to show you all these in here as, as we go through. So uh, that's out of the. 20, we saw four in here. We saw shallow effect, uh, the callous, uh, callousness and lack of empathy, uh, lack of remorse, and a grandiose, grandiose uh, sense of self. We can call lots of people, lots of people psychopaths, but she's on page four between Ramirez and Bundy. So there you go. She book. is. We don't have to guess. And we can work on the mechanics from there. Um, the thing you notice in the beginning, there's a show in the 1960s called Dragnet. And the guy would always say, just the facts, ma'am. 
That's all you're hearing, just the facts. They're not real facts, but they're just the facts. She's telling a story with all the passion of telling you about ironing her socks. There's just nothing to it. She walks through it, it's mechanical. If you listen to, if you listen to pitch, tone, and cadence. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning, and Christy was dying. If I was telling you about a child, one of my children being harmed, my pitch would be rising because my voice is rising because I would feel that pain, typically. The tone may be more driving in telling you something. She's flat, shallow affect. There's no affect to her. And her cadence is monotonous. It's just bum, 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 bum. She's doing that romancer thing. She's staring you right in the eyes the whole time she's telling it because she's looking to see what's going on and to make sure that you are paying attention. There's a one shoulder up when she says, we, I guess. And when she raised that shoulder at one at, I guess, and then she goes, I guess you would say that's a, a pause for her to think. And then she does this God, all the blood, God, the, all the blood. There is no emphasis on that. The last two things, her brow raises at I stopped. So I stopped. And her brow raises at, and one bullet went this way and one bullet went the other way. One caught me in the arm, the other one I went off somewhere. The only times I see any kind of request for approval or any kind of connection, I think she just doesn't know what he, what's normal human behavior. That's what I see here. Never seen her before, fresh to it, only heard afterwards what she was up to. So I come fresh to this and I hear immediately a, a story that if it were my story, I would expect to have feelings of fear or anger or confusion or surprise. There's enough in there for me to say, if I was part of that narrative, I, I, I might have some fear, there may be some anger, there may be con some confusion, there may be some surprise. I don't see any of those emotions on her. I don't see any of them stated. She doesn't verbally state them, but there's enough in there that I would expect many human beings, including myself, to experience some of that. So that's kind of interesting. Not only is it read like a poor narrator, I think the reason we go, that's like really poor narration, is it's written like a melodramatic novel. And so we tend to go, well, that's a really bad reading of what could be super melodramatic and quite emotional. So again, we go, where's the emotion in the voice? Where's the emotion that fits with all the blood, all the pain? That's a great piece of writing all the blood, all the pain, uh, we would expect a huge amount of emotion to be wrapped around that. We don't see it. So of course, you know, I instantly go, well, this looks like it's, it's somewhere on an antisocial behavioral disorder spectrum. However, uh, what I have to do is go, well, I'm not in the room with this person right now. They're not threatening me in any way. Uh, I don't know the whole story, so I'm going to suspend my judgment about this. Now, you, know, you and I, we, we all know now what she's done. But what I want you to pay attention to is just because you hear and see these things in actual life out there doesn't mean you've got somebody with an antisocial behavioral disorder. Okay, it's just, the two things don't fit. We're pretty lucky here because it's like, okay, Guns, I mean, all, all the other things of an antisocial behavioral disorder come out. Yeah, risky, risky stuff. Okay, so, so it all converges in the right way. But you have to be careful for yourself that if you come across somebody who talks in this way, who affects or doesn't affect in this way, so long as you can look around you and go, yeah, I see where the exits are. There's other people around me. I've got plenty <laughs> of resource around me. I'll be like, let's talk some more. Let's, let's suspend judgment, lean in, talk some more, see what actually might be happening here. So, yeah, absolutely. First sniff of this, I go, antisocial behavioral disorder absolutely but because i'm not in the same room as her right now i go let's have a look let's see what else is going on there that's what i got for you just out i guess sightseeing i guess you'd say and the kids got tired they fell asleep in the car so i decided to just head on home but i saw a road i hadn't been on before we like to take back roads and just went down that road and there was a guy standing in the road flagging me down, so I stopped. Everything was done in a matter of five or 10 seconds. He swung himself around and fired twice. One caught him in the arm, the other one I went off somewhere. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning and Christy was dying. God, the, all the blood, all the pain. 
if I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. I love this one. If you want to talk about an embedded confession, this is a dumb person embedded confession. She's saying, look, I would have thought this out and I would not have made it look like something dumb. That's evidence that it's real. How does that possibly even cross your mind when you're sitting up and thinking this? This just proves they're not all smart. They're not all super geniuses. She's not. She's dumb and she's a psychopath. We got that. Both of those things figured out now. There's anger at the one point she's challenged. If you look at her challenged, she sets her jaw. Her lower teeth are exposed. She narrows her mouth into a pursing move. Her, she makes hard eye contact and her voice changes to terse and her tone changes and her cadence changes. She's telling. That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. And here's the one interesting thing. There's a study that says that psychopaths' pupils don't dilate to negative emotions. Ding, ding, ding. Look at this. No movement whatsoever. So there's another, another instance we're looking for. She starts illustrating with her brow and brow beating with her forehead to make the point. And then she does this kind of throwaway word or Scott, as you would call it, fading facts that crazy that's crazy well because she doesn't like that word there are a couple of others she's more animated when she's angry than she is telling you a story about her children being killed there's something wrong with this right out the gate so we have more audiobook narration there's this she's speaking as if she's reading like an ikea furniture assembly instruction guide that's insane to think that i would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself that's crazy I think it's important here to note that she's mentioning insane and crazy in the same little sentence, which could be a hint at her subconscious thinking about what a defense strategy might be or what a future defense might be for her. And there's an eye flutter, which means her eyes are blinking rapidly, both at the moment she says insane and at the moment she says crazy, which is a huge red flag. But overall, throughout this whole video, there's a lack of denial. And keep in mind, one of the famous things that I like to talk about is the vanishing perpetrator. And it's all here. This is defense versus providing information. And that's one of the biggest things that you can ever look at talking to anybody. Is there a defense or are they providing information? It's a huge difference. And anybody can hear that. It's interesting. There's a chin tuck. The chin goes down at the moment. She's saying, that's crazy. And we tuck our chins down out of a protective or fearful response. But she's planting all of these questions and trying to use those to kind of change your mind. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? This is sometimes effective in other scenarios. And because in all persuasion and influence, this includes interrogation, this includes doing a TV interview with a, a psychopath, your primary resource is focus. Above all else, capturing the ability to capture someone's focus is number one. And focus is driven by questions. Questions are the steering wheel for focus. And I think that she's somehow unconsciously absorbed this over her lifetime, and she's using this questioning thing to drive what you're focusing on. Why didn't all of these things happen, and why didn't this add up? Questions drive focus. So emphatic non-contractions going on there. That's when uh, the words don't get shorter. They're, they're, they're full length and actually maybe even elongated. So they become very emphatic. Would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? For me and, and anybody who, like me, grew up as a kid in the 70s, uh, it sounds like Texas Instruments speak and spell. I don't know whether anybody else remembers uh, that, but I used to love that thing because, because I was particularly bad at spelling and I thought that's amazing that thing can spell you know and it would go spell regulator r e g you, you know had a fantastic way of of getting its itself around these words so reminds me of Texas Instruments speak and spell so it's quite I guess mechanical and again that puts us off because it feels very inhumane feels very unhuman that's going to make us stand away from her and go oh i don't like this now in this case we have every right to but again if somebody speaks like this 
it doesn't necessarily mean that they're psychopathic. There, there, there could be a whole bunch of reasons why they don't contract. And, and they're quite emphatic about some elements of it. There is a sense there of indignation. You see that she lowers her head with anger. So look, this idea that might be propagated that anybody with antisocial behavioral disorder or psychopathy doesn't feel emotions. Yeah, they can absolutely feel emotions to some extent, okay? They just don't feel them when we would expect them to feel them. That's why they're antisocial. In order to be part of society, you need to feel remorse at certain times. You need to feel anger at certain times. You need to feel sorrow or happiness at certain times. These may be limited or just in the wrong place to exist within society. So they become outsiders of that society, antisocial, not part of the social network. So I think we do see anger in her. And that's, that's an emotion, the head lowers for anger and it's indignation. I've been, I'm being wrongly uh, found out or accused here. It's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. Single shoulder shrug on bring the witnesses against myself. So I don't think she believes that she ever brought witnesses against herself. My guess is, though I don't know, they showed up anyway without that. This is an element of being grandiose which is to say that you can take the things that should be against you and say, actually, I caused that thing to happen. I caused the witnesses to show up. That's my good. I can choose. I can choose my pain. I can choose what happens to me. So elements of, of, of grandiosity. I'm going to go through three more of, from the from the uh, hair psychopathy checklist. And so you'll have an idea of, of how many are on there and how to go about uh, checking or talking to someone. I'll put a link below to um, somewhere you can go find out about that. And there'll be some books and stuff there as well, some links to books. Now, first thing we see again is that um, shallow affect. There's no emotion there, no emotion at all. Not only because she can't do it. She doesn't know how to do it. So that's number one is the shallow effect. The second we see again is the, the grandiose sense of self, where she says, uh, wouldn't I have done this right? Wouldn't I have done it the right way? Would I not have done a good job of it? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? She's assuming we think she's brilliant. And she's because obviously she thinks she's pretty smart because she knows she would have done it the right way. Well, obviously she wouldn't because she didn't. So she didn't think that out. Robert Harris says, um, a psychopath is a cunning, usually intelligent, intraspecies predator. And in this case, we're seeing that, but she's not intelligent. This isn't a very smart person at all. And we're going to see that get worse as this goes along. Uh, another one is the pathological lying that we're seeing. And she just keeps going and going and going. And she adds things on, as you'll see as we go along, to this story as well. There's things she didn't tell when she first got in trouble that she tells later on when she's in prison and trying to get paroled and, and telling what the story was. Things like that. So she's adding these things to that. In the first video, we heard her say, I, six times. This goes back to that, to be, it's all about her. Everything's about her. It's I, me, nothing about her children. And when, when her children are mentioned, very small, nothing emotional toward that. And in this case, we're hearing her say I five times. That's a lot of, that's a lot about her. It's all about her. And when you hear someone talking like that, that you run into at a bar, and you feel like you've just met this person who is, a kindred spirit with you and you say oh this is wonderful and you get along with them great and they say you know what man you're awesome i think you're great i like what you do i like you and i think you're fantastic and it goes on and they keep building you up and you feel great about that well after you leave there you'll have this weird feeling like why don't i feel completely awesome about that there's something not right here that's when you go wait a minute something's up when you leave a person that does that and you feel fine and everything's great that's one thing. But when you go back home and you're sitting there uh, or you're in your car driving back or you're sitting at home, and you're laying in the bed thinking about it, you think, well, that was fun. But that still makes me feel a little bit, bit odd because your brain is seeing things, which I've gone through a thousand times, that you're not really picking up yet. And that weird gut feeling you're getting is going to it's going to come to you later on when you're in the shower, when you're driving. You're gonna be, I don't I, there's something not right about that person. That's when it's going to hit you. So listen to that little feeling. If you're if 
to, to, to be safe. If you meet somebody and it seems perfect, but it seems too perfect, it probably is. So be careful with that. Not all people are like that. Not all people are going to be nice to you and say these wonderful things. A lot of them may mean it. But when you leave there and you have that odd feeling, something's just not right, remember, something's just not right. So that's three more from the list. They're uh, all but the uh, pathological lying are from what we covered before. So we're, 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 getting, we're getting a pretty good read on her so far from a psychological perspective from the uh, hair psychopathy checklist. All right. You good? Hey, Mark, one, one add to what you said. Hair said that they are capable of sudden burst, shallow and dramatic of emotion, but they are not long lasting and there's no depth. So, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Same thing with histrionic. Yeah. You know, so that's that's the odd part here. We're seeing sort of a combo in a couple of places. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. But at night when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That haunts me the most. I think her entire persona is a mosaic of collected expressions and behaviors and one-liners from Murder, She Wrote, Matlock, Perry Mason, and those other TV shows, and I'm not kidding because this is what a psychopath does to learn behaviors and learn responses and learn sentences and sentence fragments and how to sound like you get along with people. This is probably something that she does genuinely think about or not. And notice there's no haunting imagery of the children being hurt, which I think would dominate the memory of any mother on planet Earth. It's the, her being uncomfortable about seeing the blood. And at, at the end, her smile, in my opinion, I think it's likely a result of her seeing the emotional effect of what she said on the interviewer. I think that's why there's a time gap there. Dude, uh, the last thing I've got on there. Dang it, he got me on that one. Good catch. Thanks. Son of a gun. Okay, I, I was so psyched for that one, man. I was like, that's why I said, I think I've got the thing here. <laughs> Sorry, man. No, it's okay. That's a good one, though. Oh, that makes me feel good. You know that we that we got something similar. Again, this one's all about her. It's I'm in in, in seventeen seconds. She says I, me, and my eight times. That's a lot. That's a whole lot when it's all about you. Or when you're talking about anything, you'd be talking about turtles. You talk about turtles eight times in 17 seconds. That's a lot, you know. So she, again, we're seeing confusion with the emotion to display here. And not just the emotion, but the expressions she shows as well. Everything is odd here. Everything, the reason you feel like it's odd and then it gets weird and that smile comes up at the end, it just, it's so odd. It's going down one road and it just totally goes to another one. These emotions she's doing, like I was saying earlier, she's, and Chase just brought up, she's seeing those in TV shows and movies and she's, she's showing you what she's learned from those. So, and apparently she doesn't have a whole lot of friends because these are actually, I agree with you, Chase, I think from TV and movies. And when, when the few people that have interacted with her, I don't mean like two or three, I just don't think she's a very social person having antisocial personality disorder. I think she's, uh, I think she's just getting it from movies and stuff. So I think that's where we're seeing that again. That I'm going back to, to, to a, a touch of histrionic personality here because those emotions change so quickly in there. They just flip, flip, flip. They get really big and then really small, really big and really small. And when you go from at the end of a sentence, one emotion ends, like I was saying earlier, and then you start another one, another a completely different emotion as the next one begins, something's up there, something's not right. Um, <laughs> you totally nailed. I had a big speech going for this last thing there too, Chase. Dang it. So anyway, I agree with you 100%, Chase. I think at the end there, she's, but that's part of a histrionic personality as well, trying to make sure everything's cool and trying to make sure that girl likes her. But see, there's that, that space there where nothing's happening. She's not talking. So her brain just goes blank. And then she thinks to smile because I'm sure that woman has a horrified look on her face as she's saying all these things as anybody would be like, 
uh, to, to not be doing that would just be so, so so tough not not to be doing that when somebody's talking about all that stuff you, you just feel weird so she sees that woman being uncomfortable and she's trying to, to to make everything okay make sure it's cool one thing we're seeing here as well the one thing is the psychopathic stare is what i usually call it but you usually see that from across the room if you're in a bar you're at a party and some person keeps looking at you and you look away and you come back and they're still looking at you and you like take a drink of something turn back around they're still looking at you they're and you, and you think ah oh, this person's connecting with me no they're not no, they're not. A lot of times what that is, is that is the psychopath does that because they don't know it's weird to keep looking at you like that. They don't get that weird feeling in there that after two seconds of looking you in the eye, they should look away or three seconds, whatever it is. So they keep looking at you and they keep staring at you. And uh, what, was, what was that girl, uh, the woman that was from that we did and she smiled all the time and talked real low. What's her name? Elizabeth Holmes. She did that a lot. She was trying to pull off the psych psychopathic stare, but I don't think she understood she was why that happened. I think I explained it in that show. But that's what we're seeing there. A lot of times she just locks eyes because she doesn't know when to look away because she doesn't understand that it makes other people comfortable because nobody ever says that. Nobody, nobody ever says that. this. May be the first time you've heard this. Somebody say, you know, it's really weird when somebody keeps looking at you like that. And here's why. So. I think that's what's happening there. I think we're seeing a lot of that. And she doesn't break eye contact because she doesn't know to. It's even looking on here when I look at you guys and, and I see you look at the camera and I look away sometimes because I feel like you're looking right at me. It's just, it's just, I know we all do that because I, I watch everybody as you all do too. But that's, that's what lacks in that is that being able to break eye contact and be comfortable doing that. So I agree with you, Chase. Dang it. Down there at the end, that, uh, that smile, that's why it's weird. Are psychopaths good liars? Well, this one isn't particularly, is she? So, so there's, there's your evidence. She can't really even sustain that dramatic element that she's trying to get there, you know, doing, doing as good a job as she can. It's not too bad of being super dramatic. And the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. She's helped in this particular clip because she's got a really dramatic cello playing. I don't know where that cellist is, somewhere in the room. <laughs> I'd be like, man, I'm trying to tell my story. Can you shut up with your, with your cello? There's a cellist in the room there, you know, adding the drama to it. Uh, but, but she can't even sustain it she has to has to break and cut the tension of it for herself uh so really interesting there so again i want to reiterate there's many things that may or may not be feelings that are happening there and the main point is it's antisocial behavioral disorder because they aren't the feelings that we the majority of us would expect to have at that point and because of that that's why the dsm over time changes because society changes our idea of how somebody should act changes she's a collection of ideas about human beings so she's got that diana haircut now is that because she's being grandiose and going hey i'm i'm the most famous woman on the planet uh, is that grandiosity everybody had a lady diana haircut i had a lady diane haircut at that time i'm pretty sure like everybody had that haircut so you can't just because somebody has a grandiose haircut now it's like what does she think she is looking like lady diana doesn't mean you got to look at the time and go well what was everybody doing uh, at the time nonetheless all of that all of that said i'm only trying to you know take up space because everybody Everybody knows by now she's she's pr pretty bad and all we can really learn from this is how would we spot somebody else that's bad like that well on the whole you're never going to come into contact with people who are bad like that they're pretty pretty rare which is a a fantastic thing and so most of the time if you're in a place where you know where the exits are you've maybe got some friends with you you're feeling pretty confident you know you got a you you've got resource around you you got your phone with you you don't need to worry if somebody's staring at you now if you're on your own and you don't have resource around you yeah time to time to arm up and and get yourself out of that situation i would say Forget everything we've told you about her being a psychopath. <clears throat> this woman who is interviewing her, his name is Ann Jager. And if you do nothing else, watch her body language. She shows apparent emotion. There's slight disgust maybe in her face. Her brows point to the center. 
and that we know is sorrow. There's concern and her face is rigid. Well, we would think our little princess sitting across might pick up on that and think, hey, what's wrong with me? Why am I not making her happy or feel sorry for me or something else? And you would think she would change her tone to your point, Chase. Maybe she's enjoying it. Maybe she just can't see what's normal in a person when she's looking at her. And that's the reason she just keeps talking about blood. And she does it with all the passion of that I, I'm ironing my socks thing again. If you ever watch the movie, I'll go back to my favorite movie, Forrest Gump. Bubba Gump telling about the shrimp, and then there's shrimp scampi and shrimp this and sweet and sour shrimp. She's got all the passion of that as she tells this story. She's just loping along, and she gets right on past it. And then she does this smile. I think the smile is because she's in front of the camera. She's in front of somebody. I think this goes back to the grandiosity of personality, and this is her moment in the limelight. She's told them that she was frustrated. Now she's getting the, t the chance to say this. I think we're just seeing more of that same lack of person inside there, and I'll just leave it at that. But at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving. And the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That okay. haunts me the most. I got pregnant because I miss Christy, and I miss Danny, and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on Earth again. And I just, you can't replace children but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy, and, and that's gone, they took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. This is one of my favorites. It's the darkest thing I've ever seen come out of a single human being's mouth. I mean, there's some pretty horrible things going on. It, this would be funny if it were not so horrific. So we talk about hair. I've got a little short list here of things that she demonstrates in a short sentence. Glib and superficial behavior, lack of remorse, lack of empathy, shallow emotion, and promiscuity. We don't have to ask. I just make babies because I have a uterus. Okay, cool. Not only that, but I like babies because they make me feel good. I like babies because they're kind of like dolls. And they give me love. They give me satisfaction. They give me stability. They give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy. What they do for me, there's not a single thing in there about emotional attachment, they give her love. I didn't hear anything about her giving them love. Everything they give her, and the worst part of the whole thing is she is self-amused. <laughs> she's so unaware that she's not a human being that she just rattles the stuff off as if we're, she's in a therapy session and trying to get help. There's real joy in her face, and I don't think there's anything that you can get that's darker than this right here. There is delight and satisfaction. So, you know, if the idea is there is no emotion from a psychopath, delight and satisfaction are, are feelings. And she does have delight and satisfaction. She is delighted by the idea of give me. And they give me love. They give me a reason to live. She says that twice. Give me, give me. And there's an eye flash on it. The eyes open right up. So uh, great feeling for her on that. Uh, there's an eye roll on Cheryl. I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. She is dismissive of, of that child in particular. Children are there to serve her feelings and that's her, her reasoning around that. They are a commodity for her satisfaction. Now, again, that is antisocial. That's, that's a, now, you may find people in your life who may say something of that now and again, but all of this rolled into one, we're seeing something really quite uh, different and extreme. She has no idea how bizarre this is. You can see it on her. She has no clue. This is like the, the weirdest, oddest thing. This, and you're right, Greg, this is dark, man. She's talking about little children like they're toys and dolls. That's out there. That's bizarre. She's showing glib and superficial charm. Talks about promiscuous behavior. That's what's going on here. She's Again, she's displaying the wrong emotions for what's happening here. I'm never going to see Cheryl on Earth again. And she talks about, I won't see her on Earth again like we believe she's religious, like she's some religious person. I think that's her way to sprinkle that in there because she's heard people say that before. So that's why she's, that's another reason she's putting that in there. She's got a need for stimulation. Now that's what, because she's prone to boredom. That's another thing on the, the hair checklist. We've got four of them 
on in in this little group here. So she she wants children to entertain herself with. That is crazy for that. And it, and uh, the irresponsibility that she's showing here by saying that and by the way she's going she, the way she views children. I think this says it all right here about her or most of it anyway. But I agree, Greg. That's that's some dark stuff there. I'm just going to do a linguistics analysis here. Got pregnant. You're saying I got pregnant, not we decided or I chose to have a baby. This is weird self-focus, not just self-focus. I think the science term for this is super duper weird self-focus with yeah. no regard for the child, no regard for the, who the father of that child is. And she describes children how people describe service animals or people describe drugs on a pharmaceutical commercial. Like if you're watching a commercial for like some diabetes medication or something, that's how she describes kids. When she uses the words, that's gone. When she's saying that's gone, she's talking about her own children. That's gone. They took it from me. Secondarily, she uses the words, they took it from me. And what does it mean? That's her kids. It is her group of kids. And there's a vanishing perpetrator here. There's distancing language. It's really bad. But this whole thing about children are so easily conceived. Children are so easy to conceive. Even if she was talking about like losing a dog and just not a big deal, I can go back to the SPCA and get another one. Even that would be horrifying to hear. This is one of the worst things I've ever seen in all of our videos. And no joke, this morning I took a break after watching this video and spent 10 minutes watching baby animal videos. Not joking. Just to get my mind back in, into a good place. I got pregnant because I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on earth again. And I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy, and, and that's gone, they took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. So what do you got?